Hello, uh, my name's Cliff Freilich. I'm the Executive Director of Cinema St. Louis. Welcome to our second edition of this year's Golden Anniversaries, Films of 1970. Um, as you already know, this is a rather unusual uh, approach to having a film series in the sense that we're not showing the film. Uh, we've had to make this a purely discussion series because of COVID-19. And of course, uh, we have managed to go virtual with the rest of our events and we will be virtual for the St. Louis International Film Festival in November. Uh, but for these, uh, older works that we feature during golden anniversaries, it's very difficult to obtain streaming rights. So that's the reason why we've opted instead to encourage you to watch uh, and then uh, have a discussion with us. So uh, we wish we could show you the movies and we hope certainly next year for the films of 1971, we're back in person uh, doing traditional screenings and having introductions and discussions afterwards. But uh, we didn't want to cancel it outright. And we think this is a, a decent enough workaround. And we had a really good first time out of the box last week with David Edelstein, even though we ended up having a, a stormy night on Monday and had to move the event till Tuesday, uh, people still joined us. So we appreciate you hanging in there. And I hope some of you are back uh, for this new edition with another quite different war film. We showed MASH, or we didn't show MASH, we discussed MASH uh, last week, and now a radically different kind of war film in Patton. We wanna thank, before we get started, uh, our co-presenters, uh, and that is the St. Louis Public Library. Uh, we appreciate their support of this event, and we hope again, that next year perhaps, we'll be back at the library in person to show the films. All right, let's get started. Uh, uh, the person who's gonna be discussing, uh, first introducing, sharing his thoughts, and then we'll have a conversation that I hope you join us in. Uh, there's a chat function on the Eventive site. You can type in your own comments and questions. So uh, please, uh, I will be opening things up. Uh, uh, we'll have a brief discussion initially. Uh, and then as soon as you're open to asking a question or making an observation or two, I'll be relaying those. The person that's gonna be leading this discussion is Andrew Wyatt. Andrew, I hope you are very familiar with. Uh, he is the editor and lead critic of The Lens, which is the Cinema St. Louis blog. Um, I first encountered Andrew when he was doing his own blog, uh, Gateway Cinephile. Um, and I uh, had a small hand, I hope, in recommending him to St. Louis Magazine, where he also served as a critic for uh, online and sometimes in print uh, there. Uh, and when that ended, unfortunately, uh, we were happy to be able to recruit him to participate on the lens and relaunching it as a, uh, we had done it uh, for several years. It had gone into sort of onto a hiatus, I guess you've been in mothballs for a while, uh, but it's quite robust now. We have lots of great stuff and I hope uh, you're very familiar with it. So we're really happy to have Andrew uh, here to talk about Patton. I'm gonna uh, now exit briefly uh, while Andrew shares his initial thoughts. So I'm gonna stop my video and audio and turn things over to him. Andrew Wyatt. So today we're talking about Patton, the 1970 film directed by Franklin J. Schaffner. Um, I'm just going over some vital statistics so everybody's aware of what we're talking about here. Uh, screenplay co-written by Francis Ford Coppola with additional work by Edmund H. North, uh, based in part on Patton, Ordeal and Triumph by Ladislas Farago, and Omar Bradley's memoir, A Soldier's Story, written with Chester B. Hansen. Uh, cinematography is by Frederick J. Konekamp, editing by Hugh Fowler, and music by the great Jerry Goldsmith. Um, this film, as you may know, won seven Oscars, I believe, in uh, 1971, early 1971, uh, was also nominated for at least three more. Um, I think the first thing we need to talk about with this film and the thing that the film sort of announces itself with is this opening sequence um, that precedes even the opening title credits. And it's the, the reason the film in some ways is famous. Uh, even people who haven't seen it are familiar with this iconography uh, 
of George C. Scott entering uh, onto the screen. No other actors, no other props are set. It's just an enormous American flag and one this one figure. Um, I think the film announces itself right away in that and quite deliberately so, that it's not necessarily going to hew to all of the rules. It's going to hew to some of them, but not all the rules of the conventional Hollywood, Hollywood biopic at the time. Um, you know, after we get, we get this introductory music, we get this um, sort of ticking through uh, Patton's, uh, the various elements of Patton's exterior, the, uh, uh, the accoutrements of his military uniform. Uh, and then we get the speech, um, which is actually a fairly accurate representation of the speech that uh, General Patton, George's Patton, routinely gave to the Third Army uh, in Europe during World War II. Um, it's a spe sort of a stump speech that he gave repeatedly um, to his men. To kind of, it's kind of a, a general morale speech. Um, and as far as we know, the speech as written in the script and as performed by Scott is fairly close. Um, the speeches are performed multiple times, but based on what um, historians have been able to reproduce from observations and other uh, soldiers and officers' memoirs, it's a pretty good approximation, amalgamation, if you will, of that stump speech. And it gives you a pick, uh, gives you a, a, a window into uh, Patton's character right away. And I think this is both the film's greatest strength and in some ways its weakness in that by the time we've hit the five minute mark of the film, we already have a spectacularly precise idea of the character, not necessarily the man in real life, but in this film, the character of George S. Patton and what he's about. Um, between the, uh, the staging of it, him against this gigantic flag, the almost fetishism with which the camera regards his military uniform initially, and then this growling speech that Scott delivers. We already have a good sense for what his values are, what he thinks about the world, how he imagines himself to be, to exist within this world. Um, and in essence, everything that follows that, the next 165 minutes are essentially a restatement of that and an elaboration on it. Um, but part of the reason that opening sequence is so well remembered is not just the visual uh, presentation of it, which is um, very memorable, but just the way that it so succinctly summarizes everything that we're going to see. It's, it's essentially the film statement of, here's what I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to tell you through the life of this man, but we can pretty much summarize everything that we're going to tell you in, in this one speech. Um, and I think that it's a bold move. Um, the film that follows it is maybe in some ways in a little bit more of a conventional um, Hollywood biopic of the 1960s sort of mode, maybe even earlier. Um, but that initial scene, I think, is the first clue that we're in some, something slightly different than necessarily what we'd be expecting from this traditional Hollywood biopic of a very... Um, complex but um, generally regarded as a conservative figure. And of course part of that comes from Francis Ford Coppola's um, script, uh, which he penned prior to sort of him really having his big breakout. Um, he famously has talked about his Oscar nomination for Pat, for uh, Oscar win for Patton, essentially keeping him from being fired from The Godfather. He was very close to losing um, his job directing The Godfather and he kicked off set, but when he won an Oscar, that sort of turned things around for him and the rest is sort of history. So in some, in a, a very tangible way, um, a lot of the developments of the new Hollywood in 1970s sort of hinged on Patton. Um, but it is an interesting film in terms of where it's placing it. Um, we're sort of on the Cliff can correct me, I think we're on our third year of these Golden Anniversary series. And um, this one sort of illustrates a nice bridge between the old Hollywood and the new. It's very much a traditional widescreen war epic biopic in some respects, but that opening scene gives us a window into the ways it's going to be different. The, the way it's going to regard its character um, is not a cut and dried hero story. Um, and that's one of the things I think, you know, 50 years later, as you watch it, 
it still feels very modern in some ways in the way it regards its central figure it's it's a character study in all the right ways and it tends not to um present him as somebody who's easily understandable um that there's a there's a sense that we have to digest we have to spend we get that maybe that statement up front about Patton's values but then we need that additional 160 minutes to sit, see, steep in it and digest it completely to try to understand the contradictions there. Um, Cliff, I think you're going to provide me with some of the uh, any comments or questions from our participants. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, so that's a, I just wanted to sort of highlight that opening um, scene because I think it provides a good window to talk about the film and what the film's doing as a whole. Um, obviously the film has a lot more to say other than just that opening scene, but it's so famous and I think it very neatly encapsulates what specifically is going on in the screenplay and in Schaffner's film. All right, Andrew, I am uh, rejoining the conversation here. So um, let me again encourage people who are uh, watching on Eventive to weigh in with questions and comments. Um, uh, in the meantime, however, I'm gonna have a, a little conversation with Andrew and ask questions myself, perhaps offer a few observations. Um, I, you are correct, uh, Andrew, this is the third year that we've done these golden anniversaries. The first year, we were actually, in my estimation, a year late. We probably should have started in 1967 uh, because that is the year in my estimation in which there was a distinct break um, from uh, old Hollywood and new Hollywood. Um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, 1968 is when we began. So we're now in our third year. And Patton, I think, as you correctly observe, it is an interesting uh, bridge. I mean, it's much more traditional, I think, uh, as a film than much of what we're going to be seeing throughout the course of this particular uh, Golden Anniversary series. It is, uh, to some degree, a traditional sort of biopic, but uh, I think you're right in the sense that it's more of a character study, a psychological, uh, offers interesting psychological insights into Patton that I don't think you would have gotten before this particular period. Uh, I don't think people would have been comfortable uh, offering not just a sort of hagiographic hey, uh, approach to Patton, but also offering criticism of him implicitly in the film as well. Uh, it yeah. sort of has it both ways. Yeah, and I think that's to its credit. Um, I, I'm sort of struck, it's been a few years since I've seen it, um, but I re having rewatched it recently, I'm struck by how determinedly neutral the film itself is towards him as a human being and as a, as a, a figure. Um, it has both sympathy and antipathy towards him depending on the scene you're looking at. And it treats, it some scenes lionize him and some scenes really throw him down in the dirt and humble him and make him seem like uh, almost a figure of ridicule. Um, so it's a, it's a, I don't want to overstate that it's a complex portrait. In some sense, as I said, I think we have our key into him in that first five minutes. We, we understand what he's about. Um, I think about this in contrast with like Lawrence of Arabia, where we spend the entire, that's another epic film that we spend, I think that film trying to get inside D.H. Lawrence's head and trying to understand him. And it only slowly gets there. Patton, I think is a film where we, they give us the key right up front with that opening monologue. And what everything we see after that is restatement. Um, and I said that, that in some way that's a weakness. Um, I really do love, Coppola's script, which leans heavily on real world incident and real, uh, real um, anecdotes um, and ha has a lot of accuracy for a biopic of this sort, actually. But it does tend to repeat itself in the sense that we're seeing scenes over and over again that are telling us the same things that we know about Patton's character. And we're really, in some sense, watching him go through the important episodes of World War II in particular and seeing how that personality interacts and bounces off of things around him. Um, there's not any, I don't think personally, there's, there's, that, there's any revelations that we see at the three hour mark that we didn't already know at the beginning. But it doesn't mean it's not a pleasurable, uh, interesting performance. It's not, it doesn't mean it's not an interesting character study. 
there are some aspects that get revealed during the course of the film that uh, uh, aren't in that first uh, uh, first opening sequence. And one of them uh, makes Patton initially appear somewhat lunatic, and that is his belief in reincarnation and that he was at this you know, Carthaginian battle <laughs> right. uh, uh, in a different form, obviously. And that uh, surfaces uh, several times through the course of the film, his, uh, his real uh, deep-seated belief, apparently, in this notion that he's been there uh, over time, many times, and always as a warrior. Uh, he apparently doesn't believe in reincarnation in the sense of uh, <laughs> you're, you're going to improve on the past or try and learn something from what you've done. Uh, he always appears to be uh, uh, reincarnated as exactly the same kind of figure or so he believes. Yeah, and again, uh, I don't want to overstate the, sen the sense that the film is presenting a complex portrait, but it really does highlight the dichotomies in this guy because we've seen him... Um, we, there's a particular scene where he goes and prays at a church. We've seen him sort of uh, go through the pieties of a typical Christian American of the mid-century. And at the same time, he's sort of voicing these unabashed, very, you know, not even, not doubting it in the least, very serious and earnest statements about his past lives. And it's, it's I always think about this, the scene early in the film when they're in North Africa and he, he, he sort of veers off course and takes Bradley Omar Bradley to this uh, Carthaginian ruin and almost like he's daring him to say, say I'm a lunatic. Like he's, he's putting his beliefs, his very unconventional beliefs out there and looking him in the eye and saying, this is like, I want you to say that I'm crazy. I'm daring you to say I'm crazy. Um, that's how, that's how firm his belief is. Is he, he's willing to just, spouted off in front of his peers and colleagues and let make it, it's their problem if they don't believe him it's their problem if they don't understand uh let's talk a little bit more about that opening sequence uh from what i uh, have read scott himself was not uh, a big fan of the idea that uh, the film was going to begin in that fashion and apparently they lied to him and said that oh no uh it's not going to open the film <laughs> right. Uh, well, we're going to place that later in the film. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why he then agreed to perform uh, the, the scene. Apparently, he was so opposed to the notion of it beginning that way. Why do you think that he uh, was, uh, had that, that thought? I mean, we're entering George C. Scott's mind. Perhaps that's a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I, to I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to <laughs> presume what George C. Scott might have been thinking. He might reach out from beyond the grave and throttle me if I get it wrong. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. It, it is this, this scene that sort of breaks. I mean, it, it's, it's almost meta, right? That you, there, there is, a, in theory, the third army troops are there in the audience unseen, but he's really talking to us, the audience. It's a very, again, the rest of the film doesn't necessarily hew to those strain, to, to that kind of bold statement, but it's a very bold statement right out of the gate. And Coppola, I think, Coppola wrote the script in 63, I believe, and he's, he talked about that, like, when he turned that script in, they said, what the hell is this scene right at the front where he's giving a speech? before the credits even roll and it almost got you know almost got the script buried allegedly uh, because it was just regarded as too weird for a conventional Hollywood biopic but I, I don't I wouldn't pretend to know what George C. Scott didn't did or didn't <laughs> like about it um, you were saying earlier Cliff that he he was not generally a fan of the, the film or the role no, here, let me uh, read a brief, uh, I, I read this to you, I found this pretty particularly fascinating. This is from a, a biography of Francis Ford Coppola called On the Edge, The Life and Times of Francis Coppola by uh, Michael Goodwin uh, and Naomi Weiss. Uh, it's actually the first bio uh, that was written about Coppola, sort of mid-career. Uh, but it says, on the, one, on the other hand, it appears that Scott was less than totally enchanted with Coppola's script. In fact, according to journalist Carol Koss, who went on location in Spain with the film, Scott hated the role. It's an unactable part, he stated. It's an inadequate script. Patton was misunderstood contemporaneously, and he's misunderstood here. And I'm ashamed of being a part of it. Scott added, 
I'm doing the best I can to load the part with pyrotechnics, with smoke screens, with every dirty sneak actor's trick to bring out what I want to bring out, but I'm thoroughly disgusted with the entire part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a strong statement from the guy. And he famously um, turned down the Oscar he won. Yes, I mean, uh, he apparently uh, had some distaste. Of course, the claim for the reason why he didn't uh, accept the Oscar is because he didn't like uh, pitting actors against one another and the whole notion of competition, uh, that he thought that was a uh, an incorrect sort of approach uh, to art. Uh, but by the same token, it, it's pretty self-evident <laughs> that he, he said that while he was making the film. That's what's really astonishing to me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of self-sabotage will would would get you in deep trouble nowadays. <laughs> uh, I don't know that you're uh, you know this, but uh, my colleague Chris Clark actually asked whether or not you uh, know any, whether anyone else was considered for the role of Patton. Yeah, I haven't been able to learn much about determine much about the casting history. I suspect that. Uh, uh, George C. Scott seemed per so perfect for the role that uh, they wouldn't have considered too many different people. Now, uh, by the same token, uh, that gravelly voice of Scott's uh, apparently was wildly different uh, from Patton's own. Apparently, he had a higher voice and uh, yeah. nothing similar. He's he's a little bit. He looks a little bit like him. Not a ton. He looks a little bit like him, um, but. Compared to, say, Carl Mar Malden, who looks absolutely nothing like uh, Omar Bradley. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that Doc, he, he, Scott had already had a pretty robust uh, staged and television and film career that by that point. But, the, you know, the role that immediately preceded this with the highest profile would have been Dr. Strangelove, which has some similarities here. Um, not in a comedic way and he's not doing the anything in a comedic way here but um you can you can sort of squint and imagine the through line that that a producer drew between dr strangelove and this yeah i think we see elements of buck turgidson emerging here in uh <laughs> in scott, scott was young for the role he was only 43 in in 1970 which would have made him 15 years younger than um, Patton at the time, who was 58 in 1943, when most of the film's events take place. Um, so and you can kind of see that there's some, you know, some make some makeup and hair effects there that aren't 100% convincing in 2020. But um, he is he is young. He's playing old. Yeah, I, I found it actually quite distracting. The white eyebrows, um, <laughs> they seem so clearly dyed. Uh, they were a little too perfect. I just kept uh, watch, looking at his <laughs> shaved, uh, like he, he wasn't, he had a receding hairline, but it wasn't that bad. So you could see the, the shaved portion right here. Um, but, you know, you work with what you got. <laughs> uh, it it is a little eerie to, to imagine that, that George C. Scott was younger than I am now when he made this movie. <laughs> uh, 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 I there are aspects of uh, Patton that uh, don't get talked about in the film, the real Patton that is, that I thought would have been sort of interesting to bring up uh, and shadow uh, a little bit some of the uh, aspects of the character that uh, further complicate him. Apparently he was a terrible student uh, early in his life and had a difficult time learning how to read and becoming uh, really proficient at reading. And then, of course, he became a famous, you know, as he talks about frequently in the film, uh, his you know, love of history and of military history in particular, and he's constantly reading. I think some historians have speculated he may have been dyslexic, um, which makes sense. He also had a terrible, apparently did, wasn't a great student when he was at VMI. Um, he loved the, you know, the formations and the uniform drills, and he was great at those, but he did, wasn't that great of a student. Um, he was an athlete, too. He was, uh, uh, he, he uh, I believe, was an equestrian. He participated in the pentathlon. Um, he designed his own fencing saber, apparently. He, he, he's, he's, a, he's a, you know, people talk around the word renaissance man, but he definitely, is mu in as much as his whole being seems focused on war, there's also this sense that he is a gentleman soldier. Um, 
that he has he's literate he has all these skills and um and it's all this knowledge he can speak multiple languages fluently um and yet you know he's also this sort of right-wing megalomaniac <laughs> so the like the the contra coppola and north were very conscious of the uh the contradictions there yeah and we don't really know how much of a contribution north made uh, apparently much of uh, who can say trying to untangle uh, a script is famously difficult um uh, but apparently uh, Coppola's script, he wrote it solo, and then, uh, in fact, I believe, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, Calder Willingham was originally involved, and Coppola came in and wrote the script, and uh, was relatively, it was relatively well embraced, although I am told that Coppola himself says uh, from the DVD that he uh, was fired from Patton because of that opening scene, because it was so unconventional. However, he finished the script. I mean, so he wasn't fired per se. Uh, and apparently, uh, even though Scott didn't like the script, he did insist on uh, going back to Coppola's basic, uh, uh, basic template as opposed to the various revisions that were done subsequently. So he must have been somewhat of two minds, not dissimilar to Patton, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know that the film is loaded with real historical incident. Um, almost every set piece that, you know, occurs in the film is based strongly on real world incidences. And I, I don't want to speak to its historical accuracy. I'm not a historian or a military historian, but um, it is notable that, you know, the, the film, things in the film that seem fanciful, if you don't know Patton's story, the things in the film that seem fanciful and like Hollywood inventions, like, the irony of the Germans bombing his Tunisian headquarters just as he's dressing down the, the British for their lack of air support actually happened. The ceiling collapsed while they were having that conversation in real life. Um, shooting the mules on the bridge as they're making the overland march in Sicily. Like those are real incidences. And you, you can see how Coppola looked at uh, Farrago's biography and Bradley's memoir and just seized on these moments that had sort of entered almost military folklore and built the, the, the film around those moments. There are liberties, obviously. Um, a lot of sequences are sort of, they play, the thing they're taking the greatest liberties with are who was present for which conversations. Um, but a lot of the big sort of big flashy incidents, because Patton's a big flashy guy, actually actually occurred. Now, one of the strangest choices I thought, and I don't know what the reasoning was, perhaps you have some insight here, is the exclusion of any representation of Eisenhower, because he apparently was in some of those, he should have been in some of those sequences. Yeah, I've thought about that, and I, I don't know, I'd like to think, I, I think of Ike as like this hovering presence, you know, he's supreme, he isn't just an American here. He's the supreme allied commander in the context of this film. So he almost becomes this um, uh, godlike hovering figure. The, we, we talk about him, but we never see him. Um, he, in, in, you know, in reality, when they're making the decision about whether they're going to, uh, on the eve of the Battle of the Bulge, are making a decision about whether the Third Army is going to try to push in record time um, towards Bastogne, you know, Eisenhower was in the room for that conversation. So they very deliberately pulled him out of the story and made him, put him somewhere else. That's, a, that's an artistic decision that was made. So um, yeah, the only thing I can think of is it, it sort of emphasizes the extent to which Ike is, has, fought, you know, the buck stops with Ike, the final, he has a final say on everything as Supreme Alley Commander. So a lot of Patton's frustration and disappointment sort of begins and ends with Ike, but he never puts him in the same room so that we never have a scene where Patton gets to scream at Eisenhower about, the, you know, this or that. It's, it's more of a godlike presence that's removed from the field. Uh, a couple of uh, things from uh, the audience. Um, apparently, Burt Lancaster and John Wayne were both considered for the role of Patton. Mm. Claims that Burt Lancaster was very interested and immediately agreed to the role before the first attempt at the film in the early, years, uh, early 60s fell apart. Um, certainly, he would have been an interesting choice. I think that uh, uh, Pat, uh, ultimately, uh, Scott, as the embodiment, is the right one. But 
Yeah, Lancaster, I, I, I can actually see. Um, Wayne, I'm not so sure. Ironically, even though he, you know, his tough guy persona maybe fits the role better, I have a hard time imagining him as into the character. I can maybe see Lancaster, but you're right. It's, I mean, it's Scott's role. It, it's so much of what people think about this film is about him. And as much as Coppola is remembered as the the writer, I think if you re, you know remember the one participant, it's not the director. It's not. Um, maybe it's it's Scott and maybe Jerry Goldsmith's musical cue is the thing that the average film goer remembers, uh, which is fine. And again, it's as a character study, Scott and Malden are essentially, in some ways they're almost doing a two-hander because all the other characters sort of float through the film, come and go. And there's, there's this parade of character actors, but nobody else sort of sticks around beginning to the end the way that Bradley does. So it's almost like you have Patton and then you have, Bradley here is the secondary character who's sort of put in opposition as a frenemy uh, character to him, almost to com as much to comment and to on him as to actually, you know, foil him in any way. And I assume this was a deliberate choice on the part of the director and the casting. Uh, only Scott and Malden are truly recognizable figures, particularly to a contemporary audience. Obviously, many of those character actors uh, would have perhaps, uh, we would have been somewhat familiar with them from other roles, but certainly there are no other names no. in the film. They're the only ones who um, get billing before the title, I believe. So it's really uh, kind of fascinating that this huge epic film really, as you point out, is on some levels <laughs> a two-hander. Uh, and it's so much Scott's role and Scott's film to carry, despite the fact that it's this uh, sort of sprawling epic on a different level. Uh, it's nonetheless totally concentrated on him and he's carrying the weight. Yeah, and, the, and for a war epic, there aren't, there isn't a ton of action, what I would call action in it. Um, there are a couple of um, action oriented scenes. Um, there are scenes of violence, um, but other than the, the, the big set piece I think of is the Battle of El Guitar, um, the big armored, armored division ambush that occurs uh, in the first act. There aren't any extended sequences of warfare or violence uh, for the most part. Again, which is unusual considering this is often sort of viewed as a war epic, but I sort of view it as a character study with a war going on in the background. <laughs> um, yes. I, I the war, the the war sequences thing. aren't bad, aren't badly done. It's just not, it's not an action film where we're biting our nails about this or that. Um, I think the, you know, the, probably the most effective action sequence in the film, again, happens early when the, the Germans had to do a sneak attack on the Tunisian armored base and Scott sort of standing in the street with his pistol drawn, <laughs> shooting <laughs> manually at the at the incoming German fighters. Um, so it's it's more that that scene is more presented as a moment of absurdity than an outright you know sort of thrilling action sequence. Yeah, I thought the same thing. Uh, in fact, if I hadn't seen the film in some time, the in fact, uh, it may be the only time I've ever, ever seen the film complete was at uh, Roger Ebert's Overlook Film Festival in 70 millimeter. I was, uh, it's one of the rare films actually that I've seen in 70. Um, but uh, and it, I had forgotten how little quote unquote action there is in the film. It's a lot of talk. It's a lot of talk about strategy and maneuvering and, uh, uh, but there isn't a whole lot of, there uh, aren't that many battle sequences. We do receive one, after the battle sequence that is somewhat striking uh, with regard to the sort of carnage uh, that they stroll through. Right. Uh, and he confesses that, you know, God, God help me, I love it <laughs> uh, uh, during well, that sequence. Well, and it's also notable that the film um, opens with the battle aftermath. It opens with the vultures and Bedouin, you know, rag pickers combing over the, uh, a battlefield that the, the ally a, a battlefield that had just been the stage for an allied loss um it's not a movie that sort of it, despite the fact that there are these sort of accoutrements of triumphalism um goldsmith's score in those moments when he he's not using that famous motif it almost feels like a revolutionary war film because he's using all these fifes and and it has a kind of upbeat feel to it but um it's a very dark film. I, I also think about the, the the other sort of unconventional moment that strikes me as sort of the 
another new Hollywood-ish gesture is um, on the eve of the, ba uh, as, as they're making the decision to push into Bastogne, um, there's a famous scene where Scott has, or Patton has uh, his chaplain for the third uh, army compose a prayer for good weather. And he, after he receives the prayer, he's reading it in voiceover and they're intercutting scenes of really some of the more shocking violence that's seen in the film, of people being roasted alive by flamethrowers and tanks crushing people. And, but we get no sound. All we get is that a little bit of a music and Scott's voiceover, which strikes me as a very grim, uh, in a film that's otherwise kind of positioning his military heroics as something laudable, it's a very grim moment. Um, it is a very beautiful film. Uh, I'm gonna try to share my desktop here and hopefully that'll work. I don't know if anybody out there can see this. Oh, you're, you're also showing your notes there, Andrew, so you need oh. to minimize your notes. Well, I'm yeah, showing there the, we go. I'm showing the wrong screen, right? Yes, uh, I don't know what that's from, but it is very striking. <laughs> but All it's right. not Batten. Let's try a different, different screen. Um, well, I'm not, I'm not particularly good at this apparently. <laughs> Let's try this one. There we go. There we go. And so again, I don't think people often think of the cinematography in this film, but it is a beautiful widescreen action war epic in some sense. And again, because of so many, there are so many talky scenes and because it's such a character centered scene, uh, I don't think people often think of it that way, but it really is a beautiful film. And, it, and it's another way in which I, I think of Lawrence of Arabia when I think of this film. Um, there's just some really striking, obviously you put a camera on wide shots of deserts and countryside and you usually can't go wrong but um, just some beautiful compositions and the way that um, here's what I love where you get to see the artillery in the background as they're ambushing the Rommel's armored division you get to see the blooms of smoke out of focus in the on the right there um, just, again you can't go wrong shooting a wide desert landscapes but um, the compositions are really amazing um, there's never a shot with figures where everything isn't sort of composed love in a very lovely way, in a very interesting way. I love this show. This is one of my favorite shots in the film. It's not one of the showier ones, but this is sort of after Patton is dressed down for uh, inadvertently uh, rubbing the Russians the wrong way. And he's just been told that he's gonna have to be play the phantom army um, rather than being directly involved in the Normandy invasion. And he sort of, at his lowest moment. And they shoot the whole thing at a, until I think a little bit later, they, they cut closer to him and, and his aide. But for the most part, the initial part of the scene plays out in this light, long hallway at this, in this wide shot. It's very interesting. It's sort, sort of, of Kubrickian on some levels, this particular composition. Yeah, and it's creating an alienating or distancing effect, but it's definitely making him seem small and pathetic at his lowest moment. And it isn't all wide shots either. I love this shot of him I think this is the moment you were talking about earlier where they're surveying this ruined yes. battlefield and there's this dying soldier that he he comes over and kisses. Uh, and, and obviously the moment is meant to highlight, again, one of the other contradictory aspects of his Patton's character is that he, he has this tenderness to him when he regards in respect to the wounded and the dying men under his charge. And... Um, despite his volatility, despite his violence, there's this odd tenderness underneath it, a, a paternal tenderness. Um, there's some of the winter scenes at best found are really lovely. I love the way the guys in the snow gear on the left are basically lost in the, in the blizzard. The somewhat surreal scene post, you know, post, post surrender during the occupation where, you know, we're not giving any explanation of what's going on here, but for some reason Patton is riding inside an equestrian <laughs> building and the press are sort of arrayed there asking him questions as they, they do. That's another thing we get a lot. There are a lot of scenes of Patton talking to the press in this film, which sort of highlights both his biggest weakness, which is his foot and mouth syndrome and the fact that he's a, he's the kind of guy who craves public attention. He needs it because his legacy is important to him. Um, 
And of course, that's one of the final, not the final shot, but one of the final shots with the windmill there in the background. Of course, there's an earlier allusion in the film, in the film to Don Quixote. So I've always loved the, uh, the, ad, the addition of the windmill in that final shot. It's really awesome. Um, maybe, again, maybe overstating things, but I still love it. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is a big fan, too, of the Bull Terrier. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, there are some questions from the audience, so let's get to some of these. Okay. Um, uh, why did the film strike such a chord at the time and do so well, uh, both at the box office, I think it was number three uh, of that year, behind, interestingly enough, Airport, and MASH, uh, yeah. and then also awards. So what do you think, what, what was going on? I mean, 1970 was a very difficult year in American history. Why would Patton be the one that uh, sort of resonated? Yeah, I mean, it's, there's certainly a sort of old school appeal. If you wanna talk about, you know, the cynicism, I'm, good, I'm sort of trying to cast my mind back to some of the other um, histories I've read of the period um, Invisible Bridge and Nixon Land and so forth, but the uh, there's a sense in which you know this represents an older kind of film, this sort of widescreen color war epic um, about an America a, a figure who's generally regarded as an American hero. So there's some sort of reactionary appeal there to an older mode, which may have been appealing at a time when there's a lot of uncertainty. But there's also this sort of, again, this sort of rumble, you know, whether you want to credit to Coppola or not, there's this a slightly atypical new Hollywoodish rumble underneath the surface. The fact that it's such a morally gray film, the fact that it's a film that is very ambivalent about the entire character that the film is built around, um, that it regards him as sort of a, a intimate and yet at a remove, not really coming down one way or the other about whether he's, uh, a villain or a hero, a fool or a brilliant man. Um, so I think there's some, in some ways it feels like maybe there was something there to appeal. Like the, you know, the older generation could see this film in 1970s and say, yeah, that's, this is how they used to make them. The great war epics about great American heroes from World War II. And then a, a younger film goer might look at it and say, yeah, this is, this looks, feels different than the kind of hagiographic films that uh, my parents' generation might have been interested in about uh, their heroes. It, it feels a lot more uncertain and uh, ambiguous about its central figure. Um, we have a comment here that sort of echoes some of the things that you said. Uh, Spike Lee cites this film as an essential watch, not necessarily somebody that you would expect to say that. Uh, no, I, I, was I can see that in Malcolm X. I can see that. <laughs> uh, the person who's weighing in here says, I was struck by a great combination of intimate character, character study with fascinating contradictions. I read the Bible every goddamn day uh, and the widescreen scope uh, with lenses so wide, the image almost looks surreal at times. Yeah, it, it definitely, I, I can definitely see some Malcolm X in this. Let's just say that. Um, and I do think, uh, I don't want to, speak for other directors, but I think you can see in, I'm not a huge fan of biopics in general. Like, uh, I don't, I don't like them as a, like, if you give me a genre, I can say I'm not really, not really my thing. Biopics are generally not one. I find them too conventional, but I do love Patton. And I think in some ways it sets what I think of as the standard for uh, subsequent Hollywood biopics that don't suck. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because you can, and, and again, it isn't necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship or a um, or a direct relationship. But if you look at sort of the great, bio, what I regard as the great biopics that have come subsequent to this, uh, Amadeus, uh, uh, The Aviator, uh, Social Network, definitely Lincoln, Capote, I think you see a lot of the DNA, and that none of those films are what you necessarily would call radical films. Uh, cinematically, artistically, but they all have um, this slightly slantwise view of their um, their principal characters. And Amadeus, you can argue that Mozart isn't even the the main the main character, obviously. But there is this sense that it it takes a certain to regard your um, your subject um, 
with a completely um that's completely a or b or c rather than a weird inscrutable admixture of a b and c i think that's a lesson that a lot of the better biopics subsequent to this took from it yeah i'll add one film to that list uh i don't know that you would necessarily agree with me but i am a huge fan of clint eastwood's bird which I yeah, think yeah. is really quite remarkable in the way in which it does not take any sort of straightforward view, uh, certainly doesn't heroicize, um, uh, and also is quite radical on some levels in its narrative construction. Uh, but anyway, uh, just yeah. a, a off, to off topic, but speaking of great biopics, if you haven't seen it, check it out. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think in particular, yeah, I, I do love uh, Eastwood's Charlie Parker and then I think in particular the AV, I think of the aviator and the social network in the sense that like those films, there's a sense that the screenwriter is presenting what they believe is a key to understanding a, a theoretically inscrutable figure. And the, the film, everything that pr proceeds from that key is essentially a statement of trying to understand this figure from, from that riddle. Um, but yeah, it, it, I do think it's influential. I don't think you see it often cited. I think Lee, I, I appreciate that Lee said that because I don't think you often see it cited as an influential film, but I do think the forms that biopics have taken in the last 50 years have, have been influenced by this. Um, I want to follow up. Uh, we had uh, one of our uh, subsequent presenters, Diane Carson, who's going to be handling The Conformist, a great, great movie uh, for us. She uh, tells Hi, us Diane. that John... <laughs> Uh, John Wayne wanted to play the role, but was never offered it. Uh, so uh, <laughs> you could obviously you did get Genghis see. Khan. So I guess small <laughs> consolation. Uh, here's an observation. It's uh, I think is quite apt. Um, uh, it's almost like uh, Patton predated social media. He says the wrong things, has to apologize, and ends up being canceled. <laughs> uh, yeah, there there is a sense, and again, one of the things I like about the film is its sort of balanced view. It's it's not incidental that we see a good portion of the film is dedicated to seeing the German view of Patton. Um, if anything, historically, there's some belief that the Germans regarded him better than his own allies did, in the sense that they viewed him as a military commander to be feared and reckoned with, and um, they were both eager to meet him on the field of battle and terrified of meeting him on the field of battle. Um, but the idea that we're getting, um, we're getting multiple viewpoints from both his allies, from high command, from his own men, um, from people who are allegedly his friends and confidants and peers and eventually his superiors, from his enemies, we're getting a lot of different viewpoints and they all have respect for him, but they all know what his weakness is and that weakness is that, that self-regard and that need to cultivate an image. I mean, you can, there's, they do make a point of showing in the film something that was real, which is that Patton made um, a big show of putting his rank, his, star, his stars on his Jeep and, and on a plate and on a flags, which was actually a little more ostentatious than was considered sort of customary for officers at the time. Uh, the officer culture in World War II was sort of a little bit more modest. And one of the reasons that Patton, Patton rankled a lot of people was because he was sort of this brash character who, who made a big deal about himself and his rank. But he always said that it, you know, the, re the rationale for putting his rank so prominently on his vehicle and on his personal effects was that he, was, he wasn't afraid. He wanted to, and he was also a, a, an officer known for wanting to get near the close to the front as possible that he wanted to sort of draw the fire and the ire of the enemy which is something that a, not a not a lot of officers wanted um that he was unafraid of, about the idea of the germans taking pot shots at him when they found out who he was but Let's of course he was also he was also a self-absorbed <laughs> um, <laughs> self-promoter so Although apparently not quite as much as that opening sequence might uh, might indicate in the sense that apparently Patton himself, except with one occasion at his wife's request to get a picture in the backyard, it's the only time he actually uh, put all of his medals on and was dressed in the sort of ostentatious fashion that you see in the opening sequence. That isn't something that he would routinely do. 
uh, but it does give a, a clear indicator of his vainglorious nature and the fact that he does have quite he a did, bit of youth, but it's self-regard. We know he did dress unusually for an officer. It was not typical for officers to wear helmets and jodhpurs, and he usually insisted on that. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about uh, the director of this film, uh, Franklin J. Schaffner, who I confess is not somebody that I ever think of highly. Uh, I think of him more of as a sort of journeyman craftsman more than anything. Uh, yet, at the, you know, he won an, uh, an Academy Award for this particular film. Uh, and he also did uh, a couple of films that people certainly have great uh, fondness for and or respect. Uh, preeminently the film that in, in predated this one, uh, the film that he made just before that, and that's The Planet of the Apes. And then he made a couple of other sort of epic films uh, after this, Nicholas Papillon. and Alexandra, and then Papillon, uh, and then probably his, his best work after, that, after this was uh, Boys uh, from Brazil. Um, what do you think of uh, Schaffner in general, or do you ever think of Schaffner? Uh, he certainly was compared on occasion to David Lean, uh, and you know this film especially uh, to Lawrence of Arabia. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I think his reputation is maybe a bit closer to a journeyman, and I don't think of him as a you know he doesn't cer certainly doesn't fit within the auteur theory. He doesn't have a personal stamp. Um, he was a workhorse. I mean, he. Um, he directed, I found that he directed 248, the vast majority, 248 episodes of um, Edward R. Murrow's Person to Person <laughs> uh, for television. He was, a, he was a prolific television director in addition to being a, a, a film director and a radio director. He, so his involvement sort of spanned the history of the media. Um, he, was a, he was a longtime director for uh, Studio One, the radio program. Um, but yeah, I don't think of him as having a real distinctive um, directorial signature or anything, but I think his, particularly his post-Apes filmography is undeniably impressive. I mean, I'm a big fan of The Planet of the Apes. I know not you're not necessarily there, Cliff, in, with your enthusiasm <laughs> for it. Um, I like Papillon a lot, um, but I know Papillon's reputation is somewhat sort of slidden over the past few years couple decades um although boys from brazil has a huge cult reputation still to this day um i, I do think this is his best film by a huge margin <laughs> um even though i do love planet of the apes i think as a if you wanted i think so he won the rare instance in which a director won his director oscar for the right film <laughs> mm -hmm. in my in my opinion yeah i papillon is an interesting case study for me because it's uh 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 I, I constructed a strange uh, personal double bill. Um, I went with a friend to see Sleeper. Uh, they were released the same year. I, we went to see Sleeper and it was such a brief film and we enjoyed it, but we thought, well, it's not satisfying. We need to see another movie. <laughs> and so we went to a different theater and watched Papillon uh, right. the same night. So a very odd double bill, self-created. <laughs> I showed, um, I showed, I did it was when I was doing films at a local bar here, I showed, did a double bill of Papillon with uh, Don Siegel's Riot and Cell Block 11. Just because we oh, were doing, well that, we, that's we did a, a logical double bill. Yeah, we did a, <laughs> we, we did a prison film double bill and that was a lot of fun. But um, yeah, I think they remade Papillon recently and uh, I didn't hear much in the way of good things about it. But um, I don't see a lot of people talking about Papillon these days, but uh, it's a great film. And I mean, I, I love it a lot, but I don't, you don't see a lot of people talking about it as this sort of um, iconic moment. Um, but again, I think Schaffner won for the right film. Uh, Jerry Goldsmith was nominated for this film and didn't win, oddly enough. Jerry Goldsmith, who was nominated, I think like 18 times for Oscars before he won, <laughs> finally for the omen of all things in uh, 76 but um it is kind of odd that um in retrospect that um the things that it, the the film won for director actor original screenplay editing sound and art direction um didn't win for music you could argue that this is probably one of jerry goldsmith's most famous scores so that's a little unusual didn't um frederick dre kona camp's cinematography didn't win either which is sort of again i, th I think it's a visually uh great film so i'm sort of surprised about that uh, yes, uh, no doubt. I, you know, it, 
Goldsmith uh, strikes me as being sort of like the Roger Deakins of uh, film composers. It took him a long time and it was much belated, but uh, well deserved. <laughs> yeah. And it's an, like I said, it's an interesting score because to me, it sounds like um, the score you might see in a revolutionary war epic, you know, a colonial epic until you hit that, those little, that little trumpet fanfare, um, which always introduces that note of melancholy into the film at any given moment. Uh, someone uh, weighs in. Uh, Schaffner served in the military as well, so maybe the material here was personal uh, as well. Which yeah, that's possible. Uh, there is an odd other note about his filmography, uh, and that is he was the person responsible for directing uh, Jackie Kennedy's famous tour of the White House. Uh, yeah. The television tour of the White House, where uh, for most of us, it would have been our first glimpse uh, into uh, that space if you didn't actually go on your own personal tour of the White House. Uh, uh, so yes, uh, he had a very interesting and varied career. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, and that would have been consistent with his work on Person to Person, um, which is mostly consisted of um, Edward R. Murrow going into celebrities' homes and sort of letting them show them around their spaces in that same way. So it, it, that, that actually sounds perfectly consistent with his TV <laughs> filmography. All right, well, uh, uh, we have no further questions coming in from the audience. So this strikes me as being a perhaps an appropriate place to wrap things up. We're uh, only five minutes from the hour mark. So we're, we've actually uh, gone for quite some time. So thank you, Andrew, for uh, your insights into Patton. I wanna encourage everybody who uh, joined us uh, this, uh, this week to come back, see quite a bit, <laughs> to have a, 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 a conversation about quite a different kind of movie, and that is John Cassavetti's Husbands. Uh, Lynn Venhouse uh, will be leading that particular discussion next week, next Monday. So um, fire up your Criterion channel. I believe that's where you can find it, although there are other options as well. Uh, and rejoin us at 7.30 next Monday for a discussion of husbands. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.